Hey, welcome to Garbro's Field Desk. Hey, 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 welcome back. So before we get to the video for chapter 10, I want to let you know on the coffee website, I've put up button stickers. I also have acrylic charms I've been working on. So I decided to see what Mule could do and Sticker Mule made some pretty good charms. They're not inside the acrylic, so they're going to be a bit cheaper than what they what the, what charms usually are but i think they're good enough <laughs> you know what i mean so on the coffee site you'll find books that are signed by me and sold via mail all the accessories and the memberships so the memberships are new i've been talking to other authors they said i was weird for not having these so with the memberships there's snuffy squad the e4 mafia and the first shirts so at the end of the video you'll see names of all the donators and all that fun stuff so that's a new thing now um yeah <laughs> i'm not sure what to really say about it and the same thing about redcon one at redcon one you have all of your protein and workout needs to keep you health safe strong and pooing on a regular schedule at redcon one you can find more than just protein powder you can find other powders that help you sleep help you go and help you stay the way you need to be in order to be at your healthiest point while you're working out you know working out's good for you yeah do even just walking along on the road for an hour every day it's still something you gotta do human beings are not sedimentary animals we're not sloths we're we're <laughs> we're chase predators so you gotta get out there you gotta move around so while you're listening to chapter 10 or any other chapters of any guard brofield desk books try and do so on the move, whether it's, whether it's at work or on a walk or chasing down your enemies with a spear for a tribal grudge, whatever it may be, get out there, get active, and stay healthy. But anyway, enough of that bull. Let's go into chapter 10. Sick Call Ranger. Chapter 10, Sick Call Ranger, Section 222. Helena's mind drifted within the murk of her own thoughts. She thought of home most of all, her mind slowly pulling the threads of memories from the darkness. She thought of sitting at the kitchen table with her brothers, her mother, and her father. She remembered how the plates, spoons, and cups sounded as they ate. The low murmur of her father's voice, the cackling good-natured laughter of her brothers, then the chiding, disapproving tone of her mother tickled at her ears and she tried to focus in on them. She concentrated on the memory, and the scene slowly began to shape itself in her mind's eye. Muddy, fuzzy faces curled in like wisps of smoke, and she tried to focus in on them harder. Grasping for the memory like a lifeline to someone falling overboard in the sea. Just as her father's face began to finally come into focus, the memory was snatched away from her as quickly as a bullet does life. She was left in darkness, and in her mind she sobbed, turning around as she searched for anything, anything at all amid the void. She heard something. A light, rhythmic thudding noise, and she saw tall, dark shapes begin to come into focus around her. Helena took a step and heard leaves crunch under her boots. She blinked, looking around as the tree line outside Raktur forced itself into focus. She heard shouting, screaming, the distant cracks of gunfire, and Helena stepped forward, making her way through the tall trees. Despite the distance, she broke into the clearing with only a few steps, and the sound slammed into her with full veracity, as if she had popped a bubble. Helena recoiled as the hammer of machine guns, the screams of the dying, and the sounds of her own voice hit her ears, and she took a step back as the memory came into focus far faster than the happier one before. Helena swallowed loudly and gasped, only having a moment to see dead children spill out of the wagon as it broke past the gate before it lurched forward in time, almost beside her. She spun around to watch as Molin took three rounds through his back, the malformed, jacketed lead bullets bouncing off the wooden wagon and skittering into the leaves and grass. 
Helena washed as Mullen's knees buckled, as breath was ripped from his lungs, as his eyes widened with the realization that this was it. This was his final moment before death came for him. Time slowed as Helena stepped forward towards the wagon, the scene advancing around her and carrying her with it. He grasped at his chest, and Helena could see now at this different angle that he clutched a pendant, the form looking as if a flower had been sliced in two. As Mullen drew in ragged breaths, she heard a name pass through his lips as she leaned in, while behind her, her past self spoke to Mullen, leaning in to touch his wounds. Helena leaned in further around her past self to try and hear the name, but she let out a startled cry as Mullen's hand snapped forward as fast as a viper, grabbing her by the front of her chest rig. Mullen's eyes glowed blindingly white as they locked with Helena's, and she tried to pull away, pushing off of the wagon and off of Mullen's shoulder. You... Mullen growled, his eyes so bright she could almost feel her skin burning in the glow. Mullen pulled her closer, his blood-smeared teeth gritted. You stupid fucking elf. Mullen, let me go! Helena cried, placing a boot beside her on the wagon as the scene froze. Her past self's hands were on Mullen's wounds, the refugees staring in shock. She fought against this memory of Mullen, punching at his arm with a closed fist as tears filled her eyes. Mullen, let me go! I'm sorry! Let me go! Let you go? Let you go? Mullen roared, his other hand still clutching his half-flower pendant while the other still gripped Helena's chest rig, slowly pulling her closer to his face. The bleeding heart that got me killed has the balls to ask me to let her go? Tears flowed freely from Helena's wide, terrified eyes as she screamed and fought against Mullen, her boots slowly skittering across the boards of the wagon. Helena's other hand gripped the backboard with white knuckles as she fought and struggled against Mullen's grip. I didn't mean for it to happen. I didn't mean for you to die. I just wanted to rescue the civilians, that's all. Mullen jerked Helena forward roughly, and her boots scuttled along the wooden boards. She was almost nose to nose with the dying human. She strained to lean her head back, to keep distance from the foaming blood on his face. You'll agree it was the right thing to do. Everyone thinks it was the right thing to do. All good and well for the mighty Helena, protector of the free peoples. Mullen screamed, his voice hoarse as blood flowed past his teeth and lips, trickling down his chin and onto his ruined chest, rent apart by exo wounds. What about me? What about my beautiful prairie lily? What about my fucking baby, Helena? What about me? Helena struck Mullen out of desperation, her free fist crashing across Mullen's cheek as she gritted her teeth, her tongue tasting the salt of her tears as they slid past her lips in the coppery tang of Mullen's blood. Flecks of blood spattered away from Mullen's mouth as more poured away from Helena's desperate fists, the crimson trails expanding to his eyes as they glowed ever white. His face was a mask of rage. His wounds sucked in wetly as he spoke, and he howled into Helena's face, blood speckling onto her cheek and mouth. Every time you sleep, every time you close your eyes, you will see me. I will always be there in the back of your mind, little hero. You stupid fucking elf. Mullen then just roared again, animalistic in its sound, letting Helena feel the wail of anguish his soul held. Helena screamed, now battering at his face with both fists and elbows as blood flicked and spattered onto her with each strike. Not my fault! Not my fault! It's not my fault! Let me go, Mullen! Never! Mullen spat, reaching up from her chest rig to grip Helena's chin. With a jerk of inhuman strength, he dragged Helena nose to nose with him and growled out around the blood flooding his mouth. Never! Pain cut across her thigh, and Helena jerked her head, looking down at her leg as blood poured from it. She heard other voices now, warbling around her with a ghostly murmur. Oh, no you don't. 
Molin barked, attempting to grip Helena with both his fists. You're not getting away so easily. Someone, Someone hold our, our fucking, fucking legs. legs! Helena heard the voice like a distant whisper of Elda Hinda's voice. She heard a grunt and a curse from what sounded like Mamoy. I'm trying, I'm trying Staff, Staff Sergeant, Sergeant, but she keeps, keeps flailing. flailing. Mullen jerked Helena's eyes back to his, and he grinned, frothy blood bubbling at the corner of his mouth and out his nostrils as the glow in his eyes began to fade and die. His voice was almost a murmur, as if he was making her a sweet promise. Till next time, then. I'll be here. I'll be waiting. Your sin will always be here, waiting. Helena stared down into Mullen's fading eyes in horror as her leg gave another wrenching pang and she cried out. This time she felt the cry for real, her throat vibrating dryly. The painkiller is wearing off too quickly. She must have had a lot of magical healing done before. Another voice said, and Helena realized that it was the voice nearest to her leg. Grab her by the shoulders, Violet. I've got her, Violet said, and Helena felt two hands pressed down onto her shoulders. More pain shot through her leg and Helena groaned, opening her eyes. She blinked and couldn't see any light, merely darkness with a glow around the edge of her eyes. I'm blind too? Helena asked meekly as she hissed, feeling the flesh needle spike back through her leg wound. No, Violet is just leaning over you. Violet, quit blinding the girl with your milk trucks, the voice near her leg said, humming softly as he dragged the thread through. Violet laughed above her. Oh, sorry, Helena. <laughs> Violet leaned backwards and light flooded Helena's eyes, squinting as sunshine coming in through a flap door blinded her. Helena hissed, blinking rapidly as Violet's smiling face slowly came into focus. The human looking down at her with raised eyebrows. You kept struggling around, so we had to hold you down. She's lucky I didn't suffocate her. Elda Henda said with a snort. Helena leaned her head up and saw Elda Henda and Mamoy held onto a leg each, while another human she had never seen before was sewing up her thigh. A tube of blood running from a glass jar to Helena hung nearby, sunlight shining through the thick liquid. Normally, Violet does that with her arms, rather than her chest. You should see her spar with the men. The human said, fishing up his suture on the last of her leg lacerations. Her arm strength is likely why you ain't sitting dead in that burning puma. Burning? Helena said in a daze, looking around and realizing she was in a medical tent. Momoi chuckled, giving her leg a pat. The poor beast burst into flames as soon as we put it in the park. Elder Hinda and I got pretty toasted ourselves. You didn't have to toss me out the damn hatch, though, my boy. Elda Hinda said ruefully, reaching over and slugging the Oni on the arm. Both the unknown human and Violet chuckled. No one tosses a dwarf, Violet said. Nobody. The other human chided, and Violet rolled her eyes. Helena reached up and levered off of Violet in order to sit up, and the human quickly supported her, helping her sit up fully. Helena groaned out painfully and puffed a strand of hair away from her lips. Her eyes stung when she opened them further, and she felt the stinging pain in her shoulder and chest. Helena looked down and saw that she was, once again, a mess of bandages, and she gave another groan, quickly reaching up and feeling for her ears. Elda Hinda smiled. Don't worry, elf girl. You're still rocking one and a half of your ears. Small fortunes. Helena breathed, thankful that she hadn't been relieved of more ear flesh. She heard an absolute concophony outside the tent, as well as the screams of the wounded inside the medical tent. How bad was it? Bad enough that there is more work to do, the human said, nodding to Violet as he stood. Bolo needs more help sifting through the wounded, and I have more people to stitch up. Healers are overwhelmed as it is. Violet watched him with raised brows as he stalked away, wiping away Helena's blood on his pant legs and looking around for more flesh to sew. She looked down to Helena, who was still grasping for her ears. We took one bird down, but the others came in hard and fast. There was some time for the base to react, but we were still a smidge too slow. We got almost all the artillery. Momoi said, grimacing as he looked over to Elda Hinda, who blew a raspberry out past her lips. We will be under attack tonight, more than likely. We can no longer fend them off at range. There's only five of the fifteen we had left. 
We're on the back foot now, not able to launch counter battery strikes. Elda Hinda said. Makarat came jogging into the medical tent, twisting her head back and forth and breathing in hard through her lips. Over here, Makarat. Momoi said, holding up a hand. Makarat spun around with a groan of her leather boots and her face lightened as soon as she saw the battered Helena. Fortunate favor! You're still here! Still here. Helena said with a pained smile, exclaiming painfully as Makarat scrambled over and hugged her. Violet reached over and cuffed Makarat on the back of her head. Ow! What? Makarat howled, letting go of Helena and holding the back of her skull. She's still healing you, bonehead. Violet chided, looking down to make sure none of Helena's stitches had come apart. As Violet checked, a haggard-looking satyr woman idled over, her arms speckled with blood all the way up to her elbows. Helena turned her head with a wince as she saw the figure pop out of the throng and raised her brows. I know you. Helena said with a surprised murmur. The satyr woman smiled and held out her hands as she came beside Helena. Battlefields are a small world, Helena. Raider of Rakhtur. Raider of Rakhtur? Mamoy, remind me to start helping more locals trapped in castles. Apparently they just hand out titles willy-nilly. Elda Hinda said with a grunt, reaching around for her flask. Ah, Seda. You one of the healing ones or one of the roguish ones that breaks the pact? Makarat asked, now watching the satyr warily. The satyr woman bowed her head as she used her sharpened thumbnail to cut her pointer finger with a quick flick. I'm Kali, daughter of Rimi, and I still hold my vow, just as all those before me. Helena watched as Kali began to rub the rest of her fingers along her bleeding thumb, weaving the healing magics that were the cornerstone of satyr rites. What do you mean, Makarat? As Makarat went to speak, Kali cut her eyes to the brim touched and Makarat stopped, clearing her throat instead. She speaks of the spited. Kali said with a smile and began to weave her fingers through the air. Those who break the vows of bloodshed, we say to our ancient Feyborn, and can still form magical contracts with ourselves. We do not kill, and thanks to this it increases our powers to heal. Helena hissed out in shock as she watched her skin begin to stretch painfully, pulling out the stitching thread and forming back together. My skin is moving? I is my skin supposed to be moving like that? Ugh. It's like it's shredding itself and then weaving back together. Elda Hinda said with a disgusted lip curl, watching over the rim of her flask. A bead of sweat trickled down Callie's temple, but she did not stop her gentle smile. Those who break the contract lose all their abilities to heal, but instead focus their attentions to creating pain to those who cause them offense. They embrace anger and hate, becoming formidable fighters. And tap into their fey ancestry, Makarat said with a squint. Your folk may have been at the very bottom of the ladder when it came to the fey, but you are still fey. Callie moved one hand over the other, and Helena saw her torn leg wounds smooth over, fresh pink skin where the stitching used to be, and a coil of thread sitting neatly atop it. Such thinking is why we were nearly hunted to extinction, Miss Makarat. Makarat's face gained a hard expression while Momoi looked around in mild confusion. What are we talking about? Momoi asked. Your friend is of the mindset that we satyr cannot be trusted. It is a normal reaction to those who do not see the fae favorably. Kali said, giving Momoya a forgiving look as he turned a scowl at Makarat, who in turn held out her hands towards Kali as if saying, Look at her, she's fae. It is fine. We are used to it. We of course never sided with the fae during the Great War, nor are we bound to her will. We were too lowly to have it afforded to us. Askin was a satyr. Makarat spat shortly, and even Elda Hinda jerked her head towards Makarat due to the tone. For the first time, Callie frowned as she healed Helena. Yes, he was. Ask him? Helena asked, looking from Makarat to Callie in confusion. Callie replaced her smile and moved her fingers, weaving the flesh on Helena's ruined shoulder back together. More sweat trickled down her chin as she spoke. He was an extremist. He wanted revenge on the other races for what they did to us. He sought vengeance rather than understanding. 
and paid for it with his life. Yeah, after obliterating three entire cities off the map. There's nothing but fields of blood and blossoms where they used to be, and not even animals will set foot on those haunted grounds. Makarat growled, jabbing a finger at the satyr. All it takes is for one of them to snap, and all you can do is hope you aren't near when their fey blood takes over. One of thousands, and now we are all condemned. The axe of one weak man was enough for the Alberdand king to strip of us of our holdings, using hate as a weapon. <sighs> Callie said with a sigh, giving Helen a shoulder a pat. It is clear I'm not wanted here, but I'm glad to see you again, Helena. We owe you much. Without further word, Callie turned and walked away, lost in a throng of soldiers and staff within moments. Hey, wait, hold on! Helena said, attempting to scramble from her wooden treatment pallet, but her knee gave way as soon as she tried to stand on it. If it wasn't for Momoi reaching over and grabbing her, she would have fell right onto her face. We don't need any bloody sack. Ow! Makarat screeched as Momoi reached over and gripped her by a horn, pulling Helena back onto the pallet. What the fuck is wrong with you? Momoi chided as Makarat held onto his fist with both hands, howling in pain. She was using extremely advanced healing to get Helena combat ready, and you were accusing her of being a terrorist or something? Let the horn brain go, specialist. Eldehinda murmured taking a third chug from her flask before putting the cap back on. If Helen is able to move, we need to get ready. There's going to be fighting tonight. Momoi rumbled in his throat at Makarat before shoving her away, and she rubbed at her horn with one hand while giving him the bird with the other. Helena, not sure what to say, quickly patted down her body and found herself now all in good order, if a bit weak and still feeling phantom pain. Well... I hope there won't be any more helicopters, at least. They're not going to need helicopters. El Dehenda said darkly, then stood, holding out Helena's bow and rifle to her. Let's move out, my little raider. Yule. Yule slammed the stack of reports onto the table with a roar, and the many pages of paper scattered across the desk as if they were leaves being blown from a tree. What in the fuck do you mean there's only five left? Yule bellowed in English, slamming the desk with both fists so hard that his mug of tea rattled almost a foot from where it had been. Gremlin cleared her throat, holding her ground in her chair while the other auxiliaries of the intelligence company all scattered for cover in Yule's large office. Agatross, calm down. Beside her, the brush-feathered harpy sergeant was plastered to the back of the chair, his eyes glued to the rage-filled face of Yule. Just messenger. Just messenger. He knows sergeant. Gremlin said, reaching over and patting Akatros on the chest. Yule, calm down. You're gonna give my troopers a heart attack. They're going to shove their dicks right down our fucking throats at oars, Gremlin. Yule bellowed in English again causing Sergeant Akatros to completely abandon his seat and skitter back behind a small couch. We have lost our standoff measures. Gremlin rolled her eyes. Yes, Yule, I'm fully aware of what this means. No one expected two attack helicopters to dive headlong into the defenses, and the NCOs had dug the guns in a cluster. It was an unfortunate stroke of luck on their part. An unfortunate stroke of luck. Yule spat in Tunka this time to match Gremlin, placing his hands on his hips and pacing back and forth. For fuck's sakes, they're going to attack as soon as the sun goes down and push in from every angle they have. Fifteen guns blaring with a stream of ammunition could hold off battalions. Five won't even give a company pause. There is still a way to win this. Gremlin said, patiently waiting for Yule to stop pacing as she looked at her nails. Yule scoffed. There's no way to win this. Are you mad? The only spellcaster is powerful enough to get reinforcements that far or weeks away, and anyone we send will be there just in time to see our forces getting put to rout. Gremlin pulled out a pad of paper from a bag she had slung over the side of her chair and slapped it onto the desk. Low for your sanity and expectations, the dwarves, Oni, and Agordlings have been waiting for the chance. Chance of what? Yule growled, slapping his hand onto the pad of paper and dragging it towards him. Gremlin crossed her legs, wiggling the tip of her combat boot. Of the Fae losing their patience, and they are holding you ransom in order to come to your aid. Ransom. 
Yule murmured, flipping through the pages with a glare. Advanced hydraulics, chemistry, food preservation. There's like a hundred things here, Gremlin. We can't just give them all of these. I know. Gremlin replied, holding up her hand with digits splayed. I convinced them that only five would be fair. They need three of them anyway in order to get the craft up and running. Yule stood, furious, then kicked his chair around so it faced him and thumped down into it, exhaling with a growl and running his hand along his face. We're going to run out of leverage and knowledge eventually. That has always been a given, though. Gremlin mused, playing with her bootlaces. It was always just a matter of time. We still have the modern tactica to keep ourselves on top, and we share a common enemy. Do you think they are just playing chicken? Or would they really let us get crippled just so we fold over information faster? Yule asked, sighing and picking the pad of paper back up again. Gremlin motioned her hand for someone to step forward and Yule looked up, watching as a nervous adorned specialist stood in front of the desk. Ferengi, tell him what you told me. Gremlin said, and she sat back, watching Yule. Ferengi cleared his throat, then spoke. From what intel suggests, the racers know that they can bounce back quite quickly from one loss, but have an acute understanding of how much this victory means to you. They know you care for your soldiers, and are relying on you seeing them safe rather than dead to prove a point. They believe they are in a better position than you. Why would they think that? Yule asked, tossing the pad down onto his desk. Ferengi nodded. It was a tactic during the Fey Wars, collapsing entire tunnels, even though it would set back holds for generations, was deemed viable if it meant it killed Fey. There are tunnels even now that are redug, exposing the bones of long dead friends and foes. Our people know the cost of victory, and that sometimes, sacrifice is worthy. What if I call their bluff and don't give them what they want? What if I let all of them die there in oars in order to prove a point? Yule asked bluntly, jabbing his bladed hand at Ferengi. What if I don't skip to their fucking beat? Ferengi shrugged politely. I do not know, sir. It may hurt your image, however. Yule stared daggers at Ferengi, who casted his eyes to the floor and stepped back a few steps, looking to Gremlin. Thank you, specialist. Step away before he pulls out a knife. Gremlin murmured, making a shooing motion with her hand. Fuck this! Yule barked, picking up the pad of paper and frisbee throwing it across the room, making a bundle of troopers die for cover to avoid getting hit. Gremlin, get me a fucking radio. I'm fighting this fire with a heaping shovel full of dirt. Gremlin leaned her head back and flashed Yule a cheeky grin. I already have one set up next door. Let's go give them a taste of their own medicine. Grun, wake up! Jolly yelled, scrambling out of his bed rack and working his flight suit around his dwarven bulk. Groon groaned and leaned up off his own rack, blinking bleary-eyed and running a hand down his massive beard braid. Where? What is it? We've been activated. Jolly said with panic threaded through his voice, the younger dwarf running about and trying to find his other boot. Activated? Groon murmured, swinging his bare, muscled legs over the edge of his rack and settling his feet onto the cool stone floor. There's no way we've been activated. We barely have a hundred flat hours combined between us all. Jolly managed to find his other boot, growling at it as he swiped it from under his jacket. Thane Stefnir has issued the Grumji, and it's a deep one because even Thane Oroth has taken up the debt and has activated every airframe that's able. Groon blinked and shook his head, looking at Jolly as if he had told him that the dwarf was planning on taking up clog dancing professionally. They... the Grumji, Really? What of the heart made them take such a debt? That human Yule talked with Thane Stefnir over a radio and must have had quite the chat because afterwards she was filled with such guilt that she immediately went and had the ritual done. She and seven other Thanes now wear the mark. Jolly said in a rushed manner, tying his boots with speed. Seven Thanes. That's unheard of, Groon said in alarm. He stood and pulled on his flight suit with even more speed, quickly taking it from where it was hung and climbing into it. He had his boots on before Jolly could even finish tying his, his shaking hands giving him some issue. So where to fly? Groon asked Jolly and the dwarf nodded. We're to report to the hangar and we'll be given our orders there. 
Jolly shouted, then took off at a run out of the flight barracks, his boots echoing down the long hallway. Groon stood, breathing out through his nose as he stroked his braid again in thought. So it is to be war, then. We fly out in anger. Talon's out. He sighed, then began to make his way down the long-cut hallway, the stone even and lamps glowing merrily. It didn't take long until he was in the hangar, walking out into a cacophony of noise as dwarves, Oni, and Yamatu ran around in a frenzy, hefting ammunition, bombs, and even fuel lines. Groon swallowed and took in the sight of the three A-37 dragonflies sitting idle in the low ceiling hangar, light glittering along their new paint jobs. The dwarves decided to paint them the way they had found them, a base coat of olive drab green with waves of brown and black to hide them as they flew over the treetops. His eyes finally settled on 077, his bird and the one he flew on training sorties. The craft sat so low in the hangar that the fuel pylons almost touched the cut stone floor and it was as squat as the dwarves who repaired and made them. They had found two almost perfectly intact specimens of this craft some years ago along with a damaged one and the Thanes had spent a fortune transporting and hiding them. It was in fact the entire reason why Kangaraz and Altharaz had been built and fortified. These holds did not protect ore and stone, though the mountains were rich in it. They held and protected these crafts of unknown origin, knowing the power they held. The engineers managed to learn a few things through the ages, but nothing of note could have been done until the humans themselves arrived. After the knowledge of how to process feather metal and other components had been accessed, the A-37s had been quickly put into working order and secret test flights were flown. Gremlins made the craft far easier to manage, allowing the co-pilot to maintain and use the weapon systems. His own 077 had been rebuilt from the damage example and was technically the newest bird of the bunch. Groon smiled fondly as remembered he and another pilot doing a weapons test, sending a missile to destroy a target wagon. The gremlin, seeing the painted target, was so excited that the missile was doing loops all the way to the wagon before blowing it apart. Groon! Groon, get your helmet and harness! And Oni shouted as she ran by, her muscled arms full of rattling 7.62x51 belts for the nose guns. Groon bowed his head and stepped off, heading towards the flight room. Inside, he saw that there was a small collection of helmets and rigs left, as the other pilots had been so quick on their feet that they had already gotten theirs. Groon pulled off a flight harness and stepped into it, pulling it up and then moving around his groin so the straps didn't tighten on anything precious. He double-checked the many pouches on the rig, making sure they were how he left them and that no one had tampered with them. I think this one would be a good choice. A voice said behind him as he fiddled with his rig, the accent one he had not heard before. Groon turned his head slightly and saw a helmet being handed to him near his shoulder. Groon had never seen the helmet before, and he chuckled as he saw it. It was painted red all the way over, with black and yellow checkers fanning away from the center of the helmet like giant eyebrows. Along the right side of the helmet, the word Elvis was spelled out in blocky military type. Thank you, friend, Groon said with a smile, taking the helmet with his free hand, the other tightening a strap. Where did this come from, anyhow? I haven't seen it on the rack. The hand waggled. Nah, no worries. It's the special one I had hidden. It should bring you luck, I believe. The hand retreated, and Groon heard the soft thump of bootfalls behind him, but the echo was odd. It didn't sound right to his ears, and his flesh began to prickle. Groon half turned, going to ask a question as to who and where the pilot was from. However, when he turned, he saw that there was no one else in the room. He jogged over to the door, looking around hurriedly, trying to catch sight of this person who had handed him the helmet. An agar dailing jogged up, her helmet already fastened and ready to go on her head. Groon, Groon, come on, we have to start our pre-flight. Did you see anyone walk out of this room, Fibbin? Groon asked, casting his eyes wildly from side to side. 
He knew that they couldn't have gotten far, and they had to be tall, judging from what he saw of the arm. Huh? Fibbin said, pinching her eyebrows together. I mean, I walked by earlier, but it was just you in there. Everyone else was geared up. Groon narrowed his eyes, holding the helmet up in his hand. I see. Wow, cool helmet. Fibbin said, leaning down to look at the red and checkered flat helm. Did someone find it yesterday or something? Groon looked at the helmet, turning it in his hand as he brought his eyebrows together thoughtfully. Yeah, someone found it and gave it to me. For good luck. Lucky you. Fibbin said with a grin, but stood up. We do have our pre-flight. Let's go get the O-77 ready. Groon slipped the helmet up and over his head and was shocked to find everything was a perfect fit, even the chin strap. Of course. Let's go. Groon and Fibbin strode across the expansive hold hangar, the ceiling only a few feet above them, cut in such a way that only the A-37's in number 9 could fit. They were almost to their bird when a loud, thundering horn shook the ground under their feet, and Groon snapped his head up. They aren't serious. Fibbin looked at Groon, worry creeping into her eyes. What do you mean? Are they cancelling the flight? No, Groon said, shaking his head slowly from side to side. On the contrary, they have awakened. Fibbin went to ask just who the hell they were, but a loud thunderous step snapped her eyes away from Groon into the large entryway from the main hold into the hangar. A large standard bearing dwarven icons was making its way towards the hangar, as well as the thunderous steps that pounded in unison. The Hinir Forninar have awoken themselves from their slumber, Fibbin. You are to see the ancient runesmiths walking for the first time since the Fey Wars. Groon said with reverence, then called out to the entire hangar in a thundering voice, Hangar! Attention! Everyone's boots thudded together as they went to the position of attention, and the first Henir Forninar came into view, its amber eyes glowing merrily like the center of a fresh forge flame. The Henir Forninar were ancient runesmiths that bound themselves to the armor they wore in battle, taking on the task of living forever and being the bearers of the greatest rune magics. Their souls are bound to immensely decorated and carved mithril armor, and only awake when a great deed is at hand and their help is needed. They must have felt all the things take on the debt, and woke up to make sure the debt is paid. Groon murmured as the three Hanir Forninar split away from their formation, each one making its way towards an A-37. Don't talk to them. Don't make eye contact. Is that all mithril? Fibbin asked, her eyes wide. That suit of armor must weigh a ton. Groon nodded slightly as a Hanir Forninar stepped in front of them, then bowed, his long braid dangling almost to the ground. We are honored to be chosen by you, ancient ancestor. A debt needs paid. The Hanir Forninar grumbled in Dwarf Ha, his voice deep and resonating from within the armor. Groon righted himself and took in the ancient's armor. He must have had a braided beard in life, as a living suit of armor had a bronze wire braided beard that ran down from the helmet. They even swung slowly, the long strands of bronze wire giving slightly as the ancient turned his head. Fibbin sucked in a breath, trying not to look into the amber glowing eyes of the ancient. Good to see the races working together once again. The Hinir Forninar rumbled. Fibbin swore she saw the eyes crinkle, as if the suit of Dwarven armor was smiling. Together we are strong. Together we shall survive. The Hinir Forninar said in Dwarf Ha, then stepped forward, its mithril boots thudding heavily on the stone ground. Greetings to you as well. The ancient said as it gave the A-37 a light pat. Fibbin cut her eyes to Groon as they both turned to face the A-37, but Groon shrugged at her, knowing what she was asking with her glance. The glowing amber eyes of the ancient dwarf farmer seemed to glitter as they walked along the craft, running the heavily armored gauntlet along the A-37's fuselage, then stopped as it found a place worthy of application. 
Fibbin raised her eyebrows as the suit of dwarven armor reached down and plucked a long-handled ornamental hammer from its belt, holding it aloft as it spoke a single word of power from under its helmet. Come, hot. It thundered, and within a single heartbeat the hammer hummed. The runes engraved along the hammer began to slowly fill with amber light, the hum growing as the light traveled higher and higher upon the shaft. When the runes on the head of the hammer burned with light, the hum was so deep that Fibbin could feel it in her teeth. Arcade on! The helmet thundered, but this time the hammer came down, hitting the side of the A-37 with enough force to rock the small craft from side to side. Fibbin went to lurch forward to stop the metal dwarf from breaking the damn aircraft apart, but was held in place by the quick hand of Groon, catching her in the stomach. Careful now, best not to anger him, Groon murmured, watching through slitted eyes. Fibbin turned to him. He's gonna bash the bird apart, it's not made to withstand hammers. It may be able to, now. Groon said lowly, and pointed a thick finger at where the hammer had struck. To Fibbin's surprise, the feather metal shell of the A-37 was intact, and the impact sight glowed faintly, not a single trace of the hammer strike marring the surface. As the glow faded, a single intricate rune of power lay glowing on the craft. The suit of armor grunted as it brought its hammer back down again, and brought it crashing down against the A-37. Now start on! It roared, and the craft rattled against the blow and glow of the hammer. A second rune appeared next to the first, and then the suit of dwarven armor that was the Hinir Forninar turned, facing Gibbon and Groon as it hefted its hammer. Fibbin could hear the other moonsmiths whacking away on the other airframes, the noise oddly jarring. Groon knelt smoothly down to one knee, presenting his flight helmet while Fibbin was a bit more awkward in her approach, following Groon's example with faltering motions and a nervous air. Fibbin swore she had heard the suit of armor chuckle to itself, but it hefted its hammer and swung it with speed that a suit of mithril armor should not have had. The hammer thudded down onto the helmet she wore, and the impact was deafening. She did not feel it in her muscles, nor in the shock of her neck or skull, but instead felt it internally, as if she had been caught in the blast wave of a large explosion. Arden Skiobota on, it said leaving a small, sparkling rune on the brow of Fibbin's helmet. Fibbin heard the words not just in her ears, but also in her head, the word filling her with the same warmth as a shot of amber spirit would. She heard the same words spoken in the thud of the hammer against Groon's helmet, but then saw someone walking along the other side of the A-37 as the Hanir Funanar withdrew its hammer, placing it back onto its belt. Fibbin stood, watching the figure walk along the right side of the craft, its shadow long and pondering. She glanced towards Groon, who was speaking short, clipped sentences in dwarf ha to the Hinir Forninar, then slipped away, tucking her helmet under her arm. She heard someone fiddling with a small hatch on the co-pilot side of the cockpit and quickly stepped around the tail of the A-37, her hand laying cautiously on the M9 in her drop leg holster. Hey, you there. Fibbin hissed out, stalking towards the figure as it leaned out of the cockpit. Fibbin skittered to a stop when she saw the human lean back and smile at her. A small pin light was between his teeth and he pulled it out, turning it off with a twist of the cap. He looked older than the one she had heard of, his hair graying near his temples. His eyes looked worldly and tired, as if he had done nothing but work for 40 years straight. Don't mind me, sugar. Just checking a few things. There was no problem with the dash that I needed to get at before you took off. The human said, tucking the pen light into a pocket on his flight suit while tossing a dirty rag onto the rim of the open cockpit. Fibbin noticed that his flight suit was similar to hers, but looked older, more worn more used. Oh, I'm sorry. Fibbin said an apology, tentatively lifting her hand away from her pistol. I didn't know there were uh, any human here on maintenance duty. There aren't. The human said with a chipper smile, and Fibbin's apologetic smile devolved into open-mouthed confusion. Fibbin, where'd you get off to? 
Groom called out as a Hunir Forninar began to retreat back to their part of the hold, their thumping steps once again vibrating the stone floor. Fibbin sapped her head towards Groon, narrowing her eyes. I'm over here, Groon. I'll be back in a moment. Hey- Fibbin turned her head back around, but the words died in her throat as she saw the man was no longer there, only the dirty rag to pay homage to his presence. She opened her mouth, closed it, then opened it again, trying to figure out just where the hell an entire human got off to in such a short amount of time. Fibbin, come on, the pushers are coming! Groon called out, the A-37 rocking as the dwarf quickly clambered up a small ladder and then used the footholds to climb into the pilot's seat. Fibbin cautiously walked forward, picking up the rag with a thumb and forefinger. It was real, even a little greasy, and she held it up in front of her face. She could even smell some kind of perfume or something on it. Fibbin! Groon barked, pulling on his helmet while flicking switches on the dash. Right. Fibbin said, quickly pulling on her helmet and climbing up the footholds into her own seat. And that's the end of chapter 10. I'm sorry some parts sounded weird, but my spine keeps popping from working out yesterday while narrating. That's the weirdest sensation I've ever felt in my life. But anyway, if you like this story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Garbro's Field Desk. Click the bell icon, subscribe for more content, yada yada. But most importantly, I want to see your comments. Down below, please leave me and the voice actors a comment. We love to read them. It's why we do this. We want to hear back from you. So please, down below, leave a comment. If you want to help support the channel, because I know ad blockers are a thing, there's a coffee link where you can give a dollar, buy a keychain, buy a sticker, whatever it may be that kind of catches your fancy, as well as books and all the other, th all the other things. Now there is something new and that is the memberships and the first one I want to talk about are first shirts. These users give 50 bucks a month to help keep this bitch running and they go above and beyond what most folks do. That's going to be Para, Chris Monsivez, and Insane Medic. You guys are absolute chads. Thank you. Now below them is the E4 Mafia. These guys give $25 a month and keep this bitch running smoothly. It'd be Josh Beatty and Crusader0625. Thank you guys. And then there's Snuffy Squad. Snuffy Squad gives $5 a month. They help kind of increase the bulk of everything and keep this thing rolling along as it always does. Now, usually I wouldn't read out Snuffy Squad names because these guys are the first Snuffy Squad folks. I'm going to read them out. Damian McEwen, Anto, Inquisitor Matt, Duncan D, Ein with a gun, and 6 by 5 by 5 5 Thank you guys. You guys are the first Snuffy Squad members. <laughs> but anyway, you guys know the drill. Check out the coffee. Redcon 1 Protein. All the other stuff. The Discord link will be down below in the comments. But that was Danger. That was Eliza. That was Fire. That was Heuristic Rider. That was Amanda. That was Dusty Parch, our senior VA, our sweet bell dam. That was RB Sounds. That was Vin. And until we see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bros Field Desk. Let's go get the. Mm, mm, uh, stop being a fucking weirdo. Mm. Okay, get that out of your fucking system. Groan! Groan! Get your helmet and harness! Groan! Groan, get your helmet and harness! I bet your father cried after sex. I've been injured multiple times in this struggle against Fae and human alike, and you don't see me asking Yule for reparations. I'm sorry, this is all so stupid. <laughs> no one tosses a dwarf. I said that so fucking weird. <laughs> what am I from Brooklyn? Ew! <laughs> She's still healing you, bonehead. Ew. Fuck, how do I do this voice again? Shit. Um. She's still healing you, bonehead. I convinced them that only five would be fair. They need three of them anyway in order to get the craft up and running. Fucking nailed it. Mm.